such an exciting time for our, for our graduates. Uh, once again, my name is Brett Friesman. I'm the Director of Youth and Young Adult Ministry. Uh, today is Graduation Sunday. What a great day. Uh, I've been the director here for about seven years now. It's crazy to think it's been that long. And uh, this year's graduating class is very significant to me because it's the first class of students that I've got to see all the way up from sixth grade to senior. So uh, they have a special place in my heart. Uh, one of the promises or personal goals that I made when I decided to take this job years ago was I wanted to see an entire generation come up. I wanted to be a rock. And it's special today because that happened. I finally saw a group come through. Although it was my personal goal to be a blessing and a rock for these students, um, it is them who have challenged and been a rock for me. I have so many great memories with all of them. I wish I could go through all of them and, and, and say memory of each, but a few that, that come to mind is uh, Lexi Fister going full send uh, from Noah's Nightmare and falling into the pond before she can even finish her swing. Uh, we've got... Uh, I think of Kylie Easterday and her blob stories. Uh, she was like terrified of it for years because of an experience that happened. Uh, I think of all the different times I went frisbee golfing or fishing with people. I think of Luke Schlund was a guy I went fishing with a lot. And uh, then I also think of all those, those students that I had the privilege of seeing stand up and make a commitment to Jesus. So it's an amazing opportunity to be here today and see the growth that's happened in these students. And because of that, you get this. Now, because of that, it's hard to say goodbye because there's such a great class of students. I'd like to start off this uh, by, say, by saying a little prayer for our, for our seniors, if you wouldn't mind joining me. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you so much for all you've done with these students, for everything they've achieved. I'm so thankful that you've stood by them, guiding them throughout the years. I pray that you continue to do the same as they head into this new chapter of life. As they potentially face new and sometimes overwhelming experiences, please never let these young men and women forget that you are always with them. Let these students continue to feel your presence and have your strength as they head off to discover who they are and what they want to do with their lives. I ask for your guidance and discernment as they face complicated decisions and grow into the Christ followers you desire them to be. Lord, help them to be bright lights in a dark world. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So, we all have moments in our lives when we have to start thinking about the future. For graduates, uh, the cliche is, uh, what are you going to go to school? What are you going to do for a career? But if we're a little older than that, some of the things that we might be looking to plan for in the future are uh, where we want to settle down, uh, when we want to have kids, maybe what we're going to do in retirement. As we look to the future, we can't help but make goals. Goals to be accomplished, what we want to do. And as we set up these goals, it's inevitable that we have to form some sort of a plan to get there. Every one of us, in one way or another, is planning the future right now. And as we get swept into planning mode, it can be easy to forget the role that our faith should have in the process. Today I want to look at a passage that can give us some insight on how we can start planning our future with incorporating our faith. Our passage today comes from uh, James chapter 4, Verse uh, 13 through 17. Our scripture reader today is uh, one of our seniors, Ethan Fenderson. Uh, here at TFRC, we believe that the word of God should be central to everything we do. So we have a tradition where we stand and face the center of the room for the reading of God's word. So would you please stand up and join me in doing that? Uh, Ethan, whenever you're ready, you can start the passage. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? 
You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Thanks, Ethan. You guys can be seated. In this passage, the author James gives great advice on how it is we should plan our future. He does this through using the example of a Jewish merchant planning his future. This passage addresses the sinful way that the merchants were going about planning their future. While addressing a specific issue of the time, James also gives us insight on how we should plan our future. He uncovers three sins that keep us from planning what's ahead according to God's will. As we uncover these three sins, we can find three guidelines to help us combat those sins as we attempt to plan our future according to the will of God. If we look at verse 13 and 14, it says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The first sin that's uncovered here is the sin of presumption. In the passage, the Jewish merchant assumes his plans are his to make. That's a common mistake a lot of us make. The sin of presumption in his case is the assumption that he has more control than he really does. And in verse 14, uh, James highlights how presumptuous that is when he says, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. There's a lack of control that we have over our future circumstances. However hard we plan or will something to happen, there are still so many elements that are out of our control. We're not the ones pulling the strings. And we shouldn't pretend like we are. A little insight to me, something I've always taken pride in is keeping my belongings in good shape. I, whether it was my action figure collection, which I might still have, or my, my uh, basketball card collection, or collecting DVDs, or any like big ticket item that we purchase. I've always assumed that I could control keeping it nice and looking new. So one of those big ticket items that, that I took so much pride in was my car. All right, in 2013, I got a brand spanking new I'll get there in a second. Uh, it's kind of like a modern day sports car. I just want to kind of set it up a little bit. Uh, very valuable. It's a 2013 Honda Insight. For those that, that know what that is, it's, it's the Honda uh, reaction to the Prius. So it's, it uh, has a killer motor. Um, and <laughs> definitely get a lot of uh, double glances when I drive. They're like, how does such a large man fit in such a small car? <laughs> And, and the answer is a, a really strict stretching regimen. But uh, anyways, so I want to keep my car looking immaculate and nice because I assume that's what I can do if I do all the things. If I follow the rules of the road, if I wash my car regularly, I can keep it looking new. Until one day. One day I was stuck in traffic minding my business outside of a school. And uh, that was when a big truck started backing up. I must have been in this blind spot. And you've been in that situation maybe where everything feels like it's in slow motion, but it's all happening so fast. And so this big truck starts backing into my car, and I panic. I'm like, what do I, what, what do, I do? What do I do? So I start yelling with my windows up, hey, 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 stop. And I was like, no, that's not working. So, so then I'm like, rules of the road, honk the horn. Now, if you ever want to feel helpless, honk a Honda Insight horn (laughs) when someone is backing into you. I kid you not, 
All right. <laughs> and I start repeating. <laughs> and I guarantee like the dad in that truck was like, who's got the squeaky toy? And he just, <laughs> boom, he backs right into me. And I was like, why? I did everything in my power. The mentality of trying to control as much as we can is common for all of us. But there's a danger with that. It can corrupt our minds into assuming we have more control than we really do. And when we start to assume that, it opens the door for the sin of presumption to make us believe too much in our own plans. The sin presented here is not only us overlooking the amount of control we have in life, but it's also a lack of knowledge, acknowledgement, or respect for how fragile it is. James compares life to a mist. It appears for a little while, and then it vanishes. The Greek word for mist, in this case, is atmis. And the root of the word meaning comes from a breeze or a morning air. When we look at the nature of a breeze or the morning air, we find that it is short-lived and that it can change quickly. It's important that we don't take for granted the time that we have here on earth because things can change incredibly fast. It's important that we don't take lightly how fragile and precious our lives are and how unpredictable the future can be. But to combat this sin of presumption, a guideline that we can incorporate into our lives is don't assume too much about the future. Don't assume too much about the future. I bet some of you have heard the phrase, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your future plans. That's a really common phrase. It's, it's not a bad thing, though, to make plans. And I, and I think about uh, what's to come, but we need to make sure that we acknowledge that there's a, a large part of the future that's out of our control. We need to have room in our lives for a little bit of flexibility because of that control we, we don't have. When we don't assume too much, we begin to buy into the truth that we're not in as much control as we'd like to be. And this should compel us. This should compel us to depend less on ourselves and depend more on God. Having a dependence on God is a huge factor in how we're supposed to plan our future. Now the second sin that is uncovered is the sin of boasting. Verse 15 and 16 say, Instead, you ought to say, If it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. The sin of boasting in this passage is referencing the overconfidence in the plans that the merchant has uh, independently from God. He thinks his plans are just going to work out perfectly. This sin creates a misunderstanding of our own limitations and moves us towards uh, the reliance of our own plans instead of God's. The root of this sin is what we've already talked about, that lack of dependence on God. James is saying that the confidence the Jewish merchant had in his own plan that excluded God was an act of arrogant boasting. He thought that he could do so much more than God could. So often, when, when looking towards the future and planning, uh, we take into consideration all the things we want, but we ne neglect to consider where does God fit in the equation? Where does our faith fit in our planning? We follow our own leads that make the most sense to us. As I mentioned just a second ago, the root sin of this is a lack of dependence on God. But as we go about planning our future, it's so important that we lean on God and, uh, and, his, and go to him for the decisions we need to make. 
We need to seek guidance from godly people in our lives that can give us wisdom. We need to go to him regularly in prayer. We need to keep him in the equation. It's important that as, we're, that as we do this, we're open to accepting the things that he puts in our lives. We need to adopt the mindset that God's plan is my plan. As we plan our future, uh, according to God's will, there will be moments in life where the plans of God don't line up with our plans. And when that happened, uh, these moments we can find ourselves either pleasantly surprised or incredibly hurt and vulnerable. We might experience this when we meet that random person who gives us the opportunity of a lifetime and changes our career. Or maybe it's at that one church service where God spoke to you and changed the trajectory of your life. Or maybe it's realizing that the school that you wanted to go to, you weren't going to be able to go to anymore. Or that career that you worked so hard to get to was no longer a reality. Or maybe there's people we love that aren't with us anymore and we plan on them being there. Seven years ago, I took this job and what a ride it's been. Um, I started working as a youth director and uh, I was, this, this summer camp was thrown on me, Hume Lake. And it's down in California uh, and as I was getting ready to go, I was a skeptic. I, I already kind of made up my mind. I was like, that's far away. It's a lot of money. Uh, there's better options, cheaper options. We're going to probably not do that. We'll do it this year because we have to be kind of faithful to what's already been planned. So I go there, and uh, as we're there, God softens my heart. And there was a moment where I realized there was God's plan and there was my plan. And I had a choice. I could do my plan or I could join with God. And that week, we took 22 middle school students to camp and 18 of them stood for Jesus. There's my plan, there's God's plan. And it was life-changing. And it was then I realized that I'm going to stick with God's plan. Um, What's so great to see over the years is uh, we started out with 35 combined middle school, high school students going to Hume. And God's plan, we have 90 going now. Seven years later. Yeah. And it's not only that. There's dozens of students that have made a commitment to Jesus through that trip alone. God's plan is amazing. And we have the opportunity sometimes to merge our plans. God has a plan for everyone. And there are times that they don't line up with ours But that doesn't mean we can't plan. There's a key phrase in this passage. Uh, It says, if it's the Lord's will. As we plan our future, we have to remember that as we plan, we need to do it according to God's will. He gives us that freedom. Hey, make your plans. Do your thing. But make sure it's of me. This phrase allows us to make our plans under the condition that God's on board. To, to fight this, uh, this sin of boasting, the second guideline that we have is one that we've just talked about briefly, is keep God in the equation. What I mean when I say keep God in the equation is that our faith should be the focal point of our decisions that we make when we plan our future. Not an afterthought, the focal point. 
While planning, we should consider if it's the path that God would want for us. And as we look ahead, there's great value in bringing our plans uh, to God in prayer. Keeping God in the equation is more than just running our plans by him, though. Like we just talked about, there's a dependence that we should have on him in the process. And when we depend on God, that's when we begin to see those plans merge. We start to see God leading us in interesting, weird ways that line up with his purpose. As we keep God in the equation while making our plans, we should begin to see our hearts align with his. The third sin, though, that keeps us from you know, planning according to God's will is the sin of omission. In verse 17 it says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. James says, if you know what to do but you don't do it, it's a sin. The meaning of sin is to miss the mark. But many times we we view that as doing what's wrong. That's only half the equation. It's also failing to do what's right. When we know what ought to be done and choose not to do it, we are disobedient to God. A few years ago, I went with a group of friends to Boise for a movie premiere. I believe it was a Star Wars movie. And while we were waiting in the lobby, uh, I had one of my not-so-fine moments. Uh, Somebody spilled a Slurpee on the ground, a blue Slurpee, and uh, nobody cleaned it up. And uh, we, we had plenty of time to address the issue, but we didn't. But then this woman walks into the lobby, on the tile lobby, and she's wearing this long, flowy white dress. And she starts walking towards the puddle, and I knew what I should do. Like, I should go probably tell her something or, or have someone clean it up. But I kind of just stood there and, and, and waited. And she walks onto the puddle of Slurpee, And what do I do? I lean over to Pastor John, who was there with me. I say, watch this. Yes, so bad. Uh, To this day, I still feel terrible about it. All right. So I expected kind of a, you know, one of those kind of uh, recovery situations. No, it was a full-on slip. Like she stepped and like, like went down. And there was blue Slurpee all over her dress. It was so terrible. And I think John leaned over to him and was like, you're a terrible person. And I, and I had to agree. But there are times in our future where we plan things and uh, we have a pretty good idea of what we should do. Yet for some reason, we choose to ignore it. We may ignore it because something else seems more appealing at the time, like seeing a person slip. Uh, Or maybe uh, God has something that's a little too difficult for you to feel like you can conquer. Or there's just the reality that we're being lazy and we're putting it off. We need to remember that God's plan for our future are far greater than the plans that we have. We have to as we attempt to plan our future with a dependence on God, we need to make sure that we are actively making him a part of our lives daily. To combat this sin of omission, the third guideline is live in the present. So often we think towards the future, like, oh, what am I going to do about this? Start doing something about it now. The best way to keep us from not doing what we should is to start doing it now. There's been an underlying theme that I keep saying to you, and there's a dependence on God. When it comes to planning our future, we need to start making that a reality today. And if you think about the nature of trust, you have to know somebody. To depend on God, you must know him. So get in your Bibles today. Learn about who he is, his nature It has to start happening today or else it's never going to happen. Maybe for some of us, we don't even know who God is. We don't know who Jesus is. Maybe today is the day you make that faith commitment. You're going to follow Jesus so you can know God. If there are things that need to get done to fulfill 
the, the plans he has for our lives, then we have to start doing it right now. As we start planning our future according to God's will, we're going to come across moments where we see his plans begin to merge with ours. And I mentioned that earlier. As we approach these moments, it's important that we remember what Proverbs 19.21 says. It says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. We can make plans for our lives all we want, but we must always remember that God's purpose for our lives is greater than any of our plans. And he'll use his purpose through our plans. But we have the ability and opportunity to align with him as a perfect team. It's important we recognize these moments because this is when the big things happen. This is when the life change happen. This is when those wild stories like Hume Lake or, or anything that's, that's crazy that's ever happened in your life happen. I just want to wrap up by uh, presenting a couple questions for you to think about uh, as you leave. Uh, the first is this. Which sin talked about today affects you most when you are trying to plan the future? We talked about omission. We talked about boasting. And we talked about presumption. Which one of those is a hang-up for you as you plan the future? The other is, what could God be asking you to change about the way you plan the future? Maybe it's just letting God into the situation. Maybe it's going to him in prayer more. In what way can you change the way you plan the future? My graduates, oh man. So excited. Um, God's got great things for you. Um, you're going to have those moments where you're going to see his plan, you're going to see your plan, you're going to be like, hey, God, come over here, and you're going to have to merge with him. But you can do it, and you're going to do it. And when you do that, you're going to do amazing things in this world. As you start planning ahead, make sure you don't assume too much about the future. Make sure you keep God in the equation. And make sure you live in the present. As you plan the future, know that God's purpose for you and his plan for you is even greater. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for this time of life where graduates can... Uh, move on and grow up and go to a new uh, life stage and uh, it's a little sad because we're going to miss them but we just ask that you're with them and you give them guidance as they go into this new chapter of life and Lord we think of all of the rest in the room there are things that we are looking towards and planning God I ask that you help us let you be a part of the equation help us live in the present and be flexible as to uh, where you want us to go and what you want us to do we love you, and we ask that you'll be with us this week. In your name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Have a great week.